Right, so I just began the recording. So for the sake of the recording, this is the systematic review seminar series, the first session on types of reviews. And I'm going to post these recordings when I can, after I figure out how to post them to the guide that kind of goes along with the seminar series. So I've posted the URL for that guide right there. Um, so I'm not sure when it's going to happen, but whenever I figure out how to post these, I'll put it in the correct session there. So this, uh, that is what will occur with the recordings. So getting started, the, just an outline of what this session is about. Um, this, uh, the genesis of this session was actually a survey that we sent to faculty several months back, looking at what kind of research support needs they had and that we might be able to address in some ways. And so one of the ones that was uh, chosen by a large percentage of faculty was support for systematic reviews. And so that's really where this session or this series comes from. And uh, I can kind of give you a little bit of a sense of where my background is with systematic reviews. So I've gone through um, training on systematic reviews. There's several courses that are multiple day courses that are open to librarians because uh, this is something we're often called on to support with. Um, and so I've been involved with countless systematic reviews at this point with students, with faculty, with combinations of both. Um, I'm a uh, kind of co-author on several systematic reviews, one of them actually in the works uh, coming out before too long. Uh, and so I've, I have a lot of experience supporting folks in performing systematic reviews. Uh, also, I have, am the co-creator and one of the co-instructors of a systematic review elective for third and fourth year medical students. So it's a two week elective that uh, myself and my colleagues have been teaching for, I don't know how many iterations of it we've done, um, for uh, medical students in third and fourth year who are interested in pursuing systematic reviews. So I've taught about it and I've helped with systematic reviews. And what I realize in doing that is it's way too much for one session or even a couple sessions. It's really a, a very big topic. And that's why I wanted to break it up like this. And so you can see the outline here. Um, this is sort of what made sense to me to break this topic up. Uh, these are the kind of common things that I would talk about with a student or faculty member. Um, but I wanted to make these kind of bite-sized chunks. So this is gonna be roughly every other Wednesday. Uh, at this time and in this WebEx room, um, uh, there's a few exceptions to that every other Wednesday rule based on uh, like the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. I didn't want to do a session, uh, so things like that. Uh, but this will go through December 8th, um, so I hope all of you can join for some or all of those sessions uh, if you can. Um, but that's really where this session comes from. And that's sort of a little bit of my background with systematic reviews and also why we're, why I'm doing this is this was something identified by a lot of uh, faculty as um, a worthwhile thing to do. So the session for today is types of reviews. And an outline of the session is going to be categories of literature reviews. <clears throat> Uh, specifically looking at systematic review versus the classical or narrative review. Then we're going to look at types of systematic reviews because I think there's some important distinctions to be made there. And really the, the session comes from discussions that I've had with countless students and faculty. These are the types of discussions we have the first time we meet um, are, is this to kind of set the stage for what type of review they're interested in doing. So, before we get started, I want to hear from uh, you, though. If you want to type your answer in the chat box, uh, what what is it you're hoping to get out of this session slash series? Are you interested in starting a systematic review? Are you planning on starting a systematic review? Are you contemplating a systematic review? Just want to know more or something else? So if you can go ahead and uh, hopefully... Some of you can chat 
put into the chat box what the basis of your interest in this, because I want to get a little bit of a sense of where folks are coming from. So I'll give give everyone a moment to do that, and then we'll carry on. So I'm seeing uh, becoming more efficient in conducting one. Have done one in the past, uh, but just for professional development, learning more about the process in case it's something down the road, um, learning more about it, uh, learning the basics, knowing the proper methods. So it sounds like people, some people are in the starting uh, phase and some are in the contemplating maybe down the road phase um, or counseling students so that's great too because uh, we meet with a lot of students who are interested in doing systematic reviews um, uh, to scoping review for your dissertation great i will actually talk talk about scoping reviews a bit at the end um, okay well thank you very much that gives me a, a sense of where folks are coming from so i appreciate that um, so I'm going to begin by talking about categories of literature reviews. And so the reason I talk about this is because people often have different expectations. And what I mean by that is people mean different things when they talk about these different types of reviews. Um, and I've run across this countless times in talking to students and faculty is we'll talk about a systematic review. And when you say systematic review, I'm automatically thinking I have a set of expectations, but those may not match the expectations of the folks who are, uh, who are doing that. And so that's one thing that I always want to kind of talk through and make sure we're on the same page. Um, so it's really good to be clear with collaborators, you know, who you may be working on a project with, what it is that you expect to get out of this. So I'll s just share to me what these terms are and how I define them. So I have this little chart that I made. So on the right is kind of the larger world of um, system or of literature reviews, and I break those down into kind of two main categories: classical reviews or narrative reviews, some people call them, and systematic reviews. And then the systematic reviews, there's a lot of different uh, categories there. So when you talk about a systematic review, to me that's refers to a methodology and it can be, it, you can use that methodology to go different places. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, but a scoping review or a systematic review or taking your systematic review and doing a meta-analysis, um, that's those sorts of things. And so, uh, you know, not to get hung up on semantics, but I, this is one of the conversations I like to have early on with folks is what exactly are they trying to do? And when they say systematic review, what do they mean? Um, let me, so this is adapted from a chart uh, that uh, from this article list, listed here, uh, comparing and contrasting systematic reviews and classical reviews or narrative reviews. So what, uh, and so uh, people will, oftentimes if you say review article, people, the thought in their mind is the narrative or classical review. So before I was in uh, libraries, I was, uh, did research myself. And so I read many review articles. Uh, they were very useful, helped you get up to, to speed on a topic. Um, so when you say review article, kind of my, the place where I immediately go is often the narrative or classical review um, versus a systematic review. And so you can kind of see the, the differences here. So in the hypothesis, this is really a big part of it. The systematic review is attempting to answer a question. Um, there's a well-defined clinical or basic research topic or question that you're trying to answer as opposed to a classical or narrative review, which is a broad overview of a topic. Um, 
search methods, inclusion of studies for review are predefined and protocol driven um, and based on the author's question for a systematic review. For a classical review, they're typically not protocol based and it's largely based the inclusion of studies on the author's intuition and research expertise. And so I'm not dumping on classical reviews. It's a very useful uh, type of article, um, but it does have limitations. Um, and there's a reason why systematic reviews are considered, you know, the peak of the evidence pyramid. Um, so that, and we'll get into that more as we go along. In terms of searching for a classical review, it's often limited for a health topic, you know, maybe just looking up articles in PubMed. For your search techniques for a systematic review, it's going to be exhaustive and you're going to be looking at a variety of search engines. Um, for medical ones, there's the big three, which are PubMed slash Medline, Embase, and Cochrane. Uh, that's for kind of strictly medical topics, but when you get into other health related topics, there may be other databases that we add on in addition to that. So we're trying to be exhaustive and we're trying to look in many sources. Um, for data extraction, for a classical review, that's typically, there's not a formal data extraction. It's a description of the findings, um, again, largely based on the intuition of the authors. For a systematic review, though, the data extraction is protocol based and it's consistent across the included resources, meaning that what you extract is going to, you're going to try to extract the same pieces of information from all your resources. The synthesis of that data is going to be based for a systematic review on guidelines. So there are guidelines such as PRISMA, which we'll talk about more in the next section or in the next, next session of this. Um, the data synthesis for a classical review, again, is, uh, you know, a description of the studies, um, largely based on the intuition of the author. Uh, and similarly, for data quality assessment, there in a systematic review, there is often, but not always, an attempt made to evaluate the quality of the sources. So you find your articles, you identify which ones you want to include, and not only do you extract data from them, but you also would grade them on their quality. And there's a number of scales, and that's, again, something later on in this series that we would talk about. Um, what some of those grading scales are for assessing the quality of the studies included, whereas that's typically not part of a narrative or classical review. Uh, the interpretation for a systematic review that's going to be based on the data that was extracted, um, as opposed to a classical review, which again is based largely on the uh, kind of subjective intention of the author. Um, and so this again isn't to denigrate or Put down classical reviews. I think there is a place for that and they can be valuable, useful uh, resources. But a lot of what goes into or what makes a systematic review a systematic review is an attempt to correct some of the inherent, you know, potential biases of a classical review. So to me, these are the things that make a systematic review systematic or how I would describe a systematic review is that it's methodologically rigorous. An attempt is there's protocols and there's guidance as to how to perform the review. And there's a really rig rigorous methodology. There's a method section. You know, that's one thing in a systematic review that is typically missing from a classical review is, you know, a, a formal methodology, predefined methodology. Um, systematic reviews are well documented because you are going to be sharing that as part of the write up of the systematic review. You have to keep good notes as to what terms you used, where you searched, what day you searched, what you did with the results, what type of criteria you applied to either including or excluding articles. Uh, again, that's typically not part of a classical review. Being protocol driven, and in fact, this is something maybe many of you have run across in 
looking up articles or looking, uh, you know, doing searches in PubMed and other databases, you may have run across published systematic review protocols. Oftentimes people are now publishing their protocol before they even do the systematic review. So it's sort of staking a claim saying, here is a systematic review I'm going to do, and here's exactly how I'm going to perform it. Uh, those protocols are, you know, they show up in published literature uh, because, you know, there's a lot of, um, because, you know, they attempt to um, perform them based on predefined protocols. And I'm going to go into that a little bit more in the next section, what some or next session in the series on what some of those things are. A systematic review is exhaustive. Uh, the, the idea is to identify all relevant resources. So the search strategies are very different from what you may be used to. If you go to PubMed and you're, I'm looking for an article about this topic, I'm not trying to find every article about this topic. I'm trying to find one article that answers my question, my clinical query. The systematic review is a, the, a very different mindset. The attempt is to find every single article or every single relevant resource. And so there's different search strategies, and this is where librarians come in and where we often can be helpful is in identifying those search strategies. Another thing that makes a systematic review systematic is attempts to minimize bias. Um, a lot of the methodological rigor is designed to minimize the likelihood of introducing um, uh, bias. Uh, question, access to the slides. Uh, yes, I'm gonna post the slides and the recording when I figure out how to do it on that uh, guide that I posted, that I sent at the beginning. I'll send the URL again at the end. Um, and accepted standards, so to, go back to what makes a systematic review systematic is the standards that exist. So those are things like you may have heard Cochrane or Prisma or the Joanna Briggs Institute. These are standards that exist for performing systematic reviews. So I, when I'm saying here though, I'm kind of describing what a systematic review is, it's not always black and white. You know, there are systematic reviews that are you know, extremely rigorous. So a, a Cochrane review, you know, if you look at the methodology of a Cochrane review, extremely rigorous, they dot every I and cross every T um, when it comes to methodologies. Not everyone is gonna do that, but it doesn't mean that it's not a systematic review. So I think there's a scale here of, it's not black and white, but I think there are some things, you know, what I've defined here that really, differentiate a systematic review from a classical review. These are some of the characteristics that make it systematic. So there are different types of systematic reviews as, as I, systematic reviews as I alluded to at the beginning. Um, the two big ones that I'm gonna talk about are the kind of classical systematic review and a scoping review, but there are other types. People do systematic reviews of qualitative data. You may take your systematic review and turn it into a meta-analysis. There are also rapid reviews where the where the methodology is sort of truncated a bit uh, to cut down on the time involved. Um, so the point uh, that I want to make here is comparing a systematic review to a scoping review because this is something that comes up a lot when I speak with students and faculty is they'll describe their research interest and in thinking about it I believe what they're describing is more of a scoping review than a systematic review or that a scoping review would be the appropriate approach for what they're doing. Um, but I think for a lot of folks, they come from a place of they've heard of systematic reviews, they know that's kind of the peak of uh, the evidence pyramid, and that's what they want to do. Uh, but not all types of questions lend themselves to systematic reviews. Um, so I just want to say a few words about scoping reviews because I find I often have these discussions with folks um, on this, and the difference is largely in the outcome. The methodologies are largely the same. Um, 
the, you know, how you identify the articles, how you search, what you do with those articles, how you screen them. That's largely the same from a systematic review versus a scoping review. The difference is what you do with that information at the end. Um, a systematic review, as you'll recall, I said, is designed to answer a question. Uh, you have a specific clinical question in mind, often a clinical question, and you want to find the answer to that question. What oftentimes I find people are, when they're describing what it is they want to do for a project, they often want to either describe the literature or summarize evidence, which to me is suggest a scoping review. And I will often advise them of that. And I think for a lot of people, They've never heard of that or they've heard of it, but they think it's not the same quality as a systematic review. So I did a search here and you can see the results in Scopus of all the articles that have the phrase scoping review in the title uh, by year. And I think this is what sort of um, uh, is where that that misunderstanding comes from is that scoping reviews, they've really exploded in the past several years. Um, so you can see 10 years ago, this was nearly almost, almost unheard of. Uh, 2018, you have maybe 800 were published. 2020, it's three times that number, over 2,500 articles were published with the phrase scoping review in the title. So, and I can say from the 2021 data, it's already surpassed, well surpassed 2,500. So it's gonna continue this trend. Um, so it's a relatively, the acceptance of it, I think is relatively new. And so for a lot of people there, they understand systematic review. They're not so uh, understanding of scoping review because it's a newer type of thing, but, it depends on the type of question you're trying to answer or what you're trying to do with the data, but a scoping review is oftentimes the better choice. And it has the same kind of methodological rigor and purity or whatever you wanna say as a systematic review. Um, but it's just, you're, you're going a different place with that. Um, you know, describing literature, summarizing evidence. So that was what I wanted to say about types of reviews. Um, so the conclusions for this session are, we looked at different types of reviews. The big categories to me are systematic versus narrative slash classical reviews. Uh, and the importance of defining these things and really understanding what it is you're trying to do. Um, having a shared understanding, this is something that it's almost always a topic of conversation when I talk with students or faculty is, you know, they'll say systematic review, but what does that mean to you when you say systematic review? What do you think that entails? Uh, and, you know, and oftentimes and students will come to me and they've spoken with a faculty member and honestly, the, the student actually has a better understanding of what a systematic review is than the faculty member that they're working with, um, you know, has a more clear conception of what that is. Uh, and so it's coming up with a different, or coming up with a shared set of expectations. The other part of this is, part of the shared expectations is having realistic expectations. So when you say systematic review, this isn't a project that one person completes in a month. You know, that's unheard of for a systematic review. Um, uh, and so what, um, and I'll, I see there's some questions. I'll get to that in one moment. Thank you. Um, what, uh, you know, a systematic review is usually the product or is almost always the product of more than one person. This again is, has to do with the minimization of bias. So it requires independent reviewers. The other thing is it takes time. It takes a lot of time. The systematic reviews that I've, some that I've been involved with that have been published, the people who did the data extraction and so forth, they were at it for a year plus, you know, so it's a product of a team of people, more than one at least and it's six months, eight months, a year. Those are kind of realistic time frames to complete one. What I oftentimes find, and this is, I don't know, 
kind of disheartening is I'll speak with a student or a faculty member and they're just trying to churn out a product. They just want to get something out there. And so they're, I can already see in the conversations how they're planning to kind of cut corners here and there to speed it up. And that comes with a cost that the minimization of bias and being exhaustive, you know, you're sacrificing those things when you cut corners. And, you know, I try to advise people on this, but I think for a lot of reasons, people feel a pressure to, you know, they know systematic reviews are great and are have a lot of cachet and they want to get their name on one, but they don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, that's the, that's the problem that oftentimes we run into, unfortunately. Um, and then types of systematic reviews, we talked about that. So let me look at the question. So a difference between a systematic review and a meta-analysis, that's a great question. Uh, I would say that all meta-analyses begin with a systematic review, but not all systematic reviews become a meta-analysis. The meta-analysis is when there are, and I'm not, this is the part that I'm not so uh, so good on or so knowledgeable about is this kind of statistics that go into creating a meta-analysis. It's really, it requires a statistician be on your team. Uh, and it's the idea that you're gonna take data from different studies and you're gonna combine that data to make one giant table of data. Um, so it's taking data from different studies and combining those. So if you know, you have three studies and they each had an N value of 100. It's combining them so you now have an N value of 300. Uh, so there's statistical means of doing that, of whether you, of combining data from different studies. And that's where a statistician often comes in is they can look at it and say, can I combine this or can I not combine this? But to me, that's what makes a meta-analysis is the inclusion of a statistician and much more advanced statistical methods. Um, for dissertations, unless it's specifically designed to be a systematic review, the literature part of a dissertation, uh, it's not necessarily, oftentimes it would be maybe more like a scoping review, um, more like a scoping review than a systematic review. Whether they go through the entire process of performing a scoping review is another question, but the techniques they're likely to use are going to be more similar, I think, to a scoping review than a systematic review. Because again, it's describing the literature, it's um, you know, kind of seeing what is the current state of the literature as opposed to defining or answering a specific question. Um, so I know in some programs they begin, you know, in the first or second semester, they'll do a scoping review on a topic that they plan to do a dissertation on, and it's for that reason, to get a jump start on that. And the last point, so thank you for <laughs> shout out to librarians. Um, yeah, that's one of the reasons I'm talking about this is a lot of us have gone through special training. And if you look, and it's not just me kind of selling myself, but if you look at Cochrane, you look at Joanna Briggs, these are not library groups, these are, you know, groups of uh, physicians who are, you know, synthesizing evidence. The, many of them suggest, strongly suggest having a librarian on the team. Because um, I think the what I referred to, or what I was alluding to about the search strategies, a lot of that is knowledge that we have that is not kind of common knowledge among folks, you know, how to create the syntax for searches, how to create those searches, um, and to be exhaustive. And, and there's evidence that systematic reviews that have librarians on them are more likely to meet the Prisma, or the often meet more of the Prisma criteria. And we'll talk about Prisma more next time. Um, it's a set of 27 items that are kind of ideal when you're reporting a systematic review that's a list of 27 things that you know a well-done systematic review will report these 27 things and studies have shown that if a librarian is included typically more of those prisma things are checked off than if a librarian is not included so there's uh, a good reason to have a librarian on your team um, 
Uh, yeah, that's true. Unfortunately, we just lost uh, Elaine. She was at GW at Himmelfarb for many years and left the university at the end of July. So just recently left, unfortunately. But there are more librarians at Himmelfarb who have gone through that training. And so we still have that help available. Um, so let me put the, let me see if I have that link. So again, here is the uh, guide where I will eventually, I can probably pretty quickly post the slides, but I will eventually post the recording. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, and let me put my email address here. Uh, for this series, if you want to, um, my plan is, and a lot of people have already signed up for this, uh, to be on an email listserv for this. If you just send me your name and email address at, at that email address, I'll put you on that list. And what I'm going to do is the day before each of the sessions in this series, I'm going to send a message out to all the people on the list saying, hey, next session is tomorrow. Here's where we're going to meet. Here's what we're going to talk about. Um, I promise I won't be spamming you with lots of messages. That's It'll be that message one the day before each session. I'll send out a reminder. So, but if you want to be on that email reminder list, please send me a uh, see. Please email me there. So, that is the end of this session. Oh, there's my email address right there. Uh, so, the next session we're going to talk about Prisma, Cochrane, and other systematic review guidelines. It's going to be two weeks from today. So, and I. I'm not old enough to have seen the show when it first ran the original Batman series, but I did watch the reruns quite a lot when I was a kid. Uh, it'll be the same bat time, same bat channel. Two weeks from now, this WebEx at noon, and that's the goal is to do these every two weeks or every other Wednesday at noon uh, in this WebEx. Uh, so we have some folks who, who did see the show uh, in its original run. Um, so for those who have seen it, they'll they'll understand the reference, I guess. And the rest of you will be confused as to why Batman looks like this. But um, so anyway, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate you coming. And it is just after 1230. I said I would try to limit these to half an hour. So I'm going to cut, cut it short here. Um, thank you so much. And I hope to see you in a couple of weeks for the next session. I'll hang around in case there are any questions. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Hey Tom, you still hey, am I still connected? <laughs> yes, yes, you are. <laughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> okay. Excuse me. Because <coughs> I was making a sandwich while we were talking. <laughs> okay, no problem. It's lunchtime for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I just wanted to say thank you. And um <clears throat> I have the, you know, there's this I've been an advisor for about for MPH students for about <clears throat> 12 years now. Uh -huh. And I encourage them to contact the librarians, and they <clears throat> they seem like that's like the worst thing in the, <clears throat> in the world they could possibly do, and <clears throat> or like you know like like that's asking for too much help, or they're gonna so mm -hmm. <laughs> so whatever we can do <clears throat> to talk about the you know the virtues of them when they have to do this um, culminating experience research project. Mm -hmm. um, or for any for their class projects, I tell them too. You know, talk to. I said this is what they do. You know, they mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what they. So anyway, um, I don't know. Uh, I'll certainly remind within the School of Public Health about the values, 
Well, how broadly was this going, Tom? What, were people across the university, or was this? Was uh, so this was aimed at so the three schools that we support: public health, nursing, okay. and medicine. So I was aiming the kind of outreach at those populations specifically to faculty, but it's open to anyone. Um, uh, I think one of our original ideas was I would do this twice a year. This series, the fall would be aimed at faculty and the spring would be aimed at students since many of them will do these projects in the summer, but either one, either one is open to everyone. It's just how we are advertising it. Yeah, I think, um, I think students have a misperception that a review is going to be quote unquote easier than doing um, <laughs> some it's, collection of data or other kind of data analysis. So I, that's uh, why um, I wanna get a better sense Mm -hmm. um, I am not an academic by training, Tom, so um, I, I come to the school as a practitioner route. So uh, this is very helpful for me. So I'm going to try to attend all of them. Okay, and great. the one big thing, Tom, I can tell you is session three. Mm -hmm. Students do, they somehow get to the end of their two years and they do not know what a research question is. And I've been saying this to the faculty. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm not a, a CE advisor because I don't, mm -hmm. don't have the right data analysis training. But when I say, what's your research question? They like have no idea what I'm talking yes. about. And it's evidently not covered in their research methods course. So, so I'm going to encourage people very much to use it. Okay. And then what, um, what I also think with your, um, you know, like PDFs of your slides, we'll start a library um, mm -hmm. for them. Or, or just with links, um, you know, give them a page of links that they can go uh, to read some of this themselves. So, yeah. anyway. and that's my and so I hope to put get all of these slides in one place too. Um, as I said, I think yeah, the uh, this uh, this will be the place where they live um, for okay. where I'm going to upload them to. But yeah, I'm happy to share them with. Whoever would find it interesting, it's I'm not attempting to limit limit it to that, but that's where they're going to be collected, at least by me. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, no, I, I will think you're absolutely right about. Yeah, that. I will Thanks. certainly promote it. So, okay, um, thank you, Tom, very much. Yeah, thank you. All I'm right, glad see you, you later. Make it. See you later. I'll see you next one. Okay. Bye bye. Right, Crank. Bye bye.